Good afternoon, this is Pamela, and you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We're going to pick back our book reading. Code Word, Arbalat, 666, Danger in the Vatican. Book One, Sons of Aloya and Their Plans for World Domination. E.D. Stewart. For some reason, my recording thing, Audacity here, keeps freezing up, but it seems to be recording even though it seems frozen. I don't know. I just pray that it's working. <laughs> here we go. Chapter 11. Spiritual Exercises. Light from Cave. According to the practice of priests of great zeal, Pope Pius XI. Friend, what is this you are doing? I am performing spiritual exercises. See how I rise. Prophets of religion, Upton Sinclair. A mysterious cloud of darkness covers all the affairs of the Jesuits. Chattabarian once said, and this is no more. So, and the spiritual exercises, an occult masterpiece written in 1533 by Ignatius Laloya. This collection of mysticism accounts in a large part for the secret of Laloya's success. These exercises were intended to bring spiritual illumination by means of systematic meditation, invocation, contemplation, visualization, and trancing. Like the sorcery used by the magicians of Egypt to effect their miracles in imitation of those wrought by God at the hand of his servant Moses, the Jesuits too have their spiritual formula. A well-trained Jesuit is really a wizard in clerical robes. Consider, for example, Ignatius Alzone, 1813-1865 who would levitate on frequent occasions during daily mass and other devotions, including the way of the cross and the rosary, on account of his practice of the spiritual exercises. The high regard in which the Catholic Church holds the spiritual exercises is seen from this decree by Pope Paul III on July 31, 1548. So that their fruit may be more spread, and the more of the faithful may be induced to use them with greater devotion. We, therefore, have caused these instructions and exercises to be examined, and our vicar general in things spiritual at Rome have found that these exercises are full of piety and holiness, and that they are and will be extremely useful and salutary for the spiritual profit of the faithful, we have, besides, as we should, due regard to the rich fruits which Ignatius and the aforesaid society founded by him are constantly producing everywhere in the church of God and to the very help which said exercises have proved in this. In early chapters, we read the diabolical tenets contained in their extreme oath and their lecture of initiation. Would a Jesuit really carry out the bloody pledges made in their abominable oath of the plans laid down in their constitutions? H. Bohemer, professor of the University of Bonn, gives us the solid answer in his work, Les Jesuits. We imbue unto him spiritual forces, which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. These forces can come up again to the surface, sometimes after years of not even mentioning them, become so imperative, compelling, that the will of the Jesuit finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow their irresistible impulse through spiritual exercises. We have just read a most startling statement. When a Jesuit is inducted into the order, he is placed under hypnotic processes, occult spiritual forces that can be invoked at any time in the future to compel him to do the bidding of his superiors. This is achieved through 
spiritual exercises, a compulsory hypnotic induction for all Jesuits, which curiously is now very popular in some Protestant churches. These mysterious exercises owe their incidents to the Islamic Sufis, magic of the dervishes, the Aladdins of the East. James White, a noted hypnotist, explains the power of the hypnotic induction. The hypnotized may fall hopeless victim to the most criminal and harmful actions, not only while they sleep, but after they have been awakened. There lies such infernal power in the hands of the hypnotizer that everyone ought to be strictly forbidden to meddle with hypnotism, especially those who are honorable and trustworthy. Except those, not especially, except, I'm sorry, except those who are honorable and trustworthy. The hypnotist, and by all kinds of suggestions, be made not only to harm themselves, but also others, and they may even be irresistibly driven to commit any crime. This power in hypnotism, and the Jesuit spiritual exercises, comes from the same occult source as yoga, which energy comes from Shiva, one of the principal gods, small g, of the Hindu pantheon, who is sometimes represented as a yogi, and in whom are said to be concentrated the powers acquired by meditation, penance, and a life of austerity. Let us then consider Laloya's formula, which, like Rasputin's hypnotic powers, he bequeathed to all of his sons. After his horrific entry and battle and many personal disappointments, Ignatius, on his recovery, retired himself to a lonely cave. There, it is said, he sought and found refuge in the religion of his birth, Catholicism. It was during this phase of the Jesuit Imago that Boloya claimed he discovered the demanding and self-mortifying spiritual exercises. The place of Laloya's inspiration was very much like that of the Prophet Muhammad, a lonely cave dug out by the Domitian monks at the foot of the mountain of Manresa, Spain, near the river Cardona. He had already been to Mount Montserrat, where he spent all night in vigil, March 25, 1522 and there hung his shield and sword upon the altar of a shrine to the black virgin, Madonna. For ten months he fasted in sackcloth, with only a rope tied to his loins. He tortured his body while practicing a form of transcendental meditation. It was during this period of self-flagellation that Laloya is said to have had great visions of heaven, the angels, and the same, and to have conversed with God, Jesus, and Mary while meditating and fasting almost to death. The book of exercises, says one Jesuit, was truly written by the finger of God and delivered to Ignatius Laloya, the Holy Mother of God. In fact, Laloya simply adapted the ritual mysticism of the Alumbrados, Illuminated Ones of Spain, the same society of which Laloya had been convicted of being a member. In fact, these exercises, so-called, were derived from the Barbalonian rites, and they have been made Laloya's brigade, most feared and the most formidable of Catholic warriors, a special cadre of priests. In keeping with the purest traditions of the Alambrados, Ignatius claimed to have seen lights flashing Jesus and Mary as well as Satan latter in the form of a spiral of light around him. His most bizarre claim was to have chased Satan around the cave like a dog with a stick. It was from these demented, distracted, insane experiences that Laloya developed his spiritual exercises, which he wrote down in a book by the same name. It was by these said spiritual exercises that Laloya claimed he was given the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was the secret doctrine that Laloya discovered in the Catholic Church. We shall learn that doctrine. We shall learn what doctrine later on. 
Pope Paul III in 1548, at the request of the Jesuit General Francis Borgia, approved the spiritual exercises as being full of the Spirit of God and very useful for the edification and spiritual profit of the faithful. And in the encyclical letter Ad Catholic, Catholici Sacerdoti, Pope Pius XI recalled the classic virtue of all the priesthood. It is not enough to withdraw to the sacred seclusion of the spiritual exercises only at the intervals. You should enter into retreat more often and for longer periods according to the practice of priests of great zeal. The Book of Exercises Course in Mysticism Unlike the regular priesthood, Jesuits make, must undertake the spiritual exercises of Leloya. During the 30-day initiation rite of passage, the novate is told what to think, how to feel, when to groan, how to sigh, and what to imagine. He is encouraged to picture the scene in his imagination, nothing all, noting all of the detail, and then to insert himself into the scene and participate in it. Thus, by means of mental control and rapture, the Jesuit is supposed to be transformed. This has its parallels in the Buddhist and Hindu mysticism of the Mahatmas, whose goal is that of conquering self. Laloya's meditation encourages the deliberate visualization of the subject with the aim of achieving transistence, transcendence, mystic yogic path of inner union with a higher self, a sanit humra. Act of imagining visualization is intended to effect a mental transformation, kind of subtle conditioning or reprogramming of the mind. This is a common feature of ritual magic exercises to employ the techniques of concentration and visualization. Also included in the exercises is the frequent repetition of anavkrisi. Aloya's own habitual prayer mantra for disorientation and sensory deprivation. A total domination of the individual's mind by spiritual forces. Roland Barthes has distilled the essence of Aloya's spiritual exercises. Obsessional character of the spiritual exercises blazes forth in the accounting passion transmitted to the extrastant. As soon as an object, intellectual or imaginary, appears, it is broken up, divided, and numbered. Being a matter of accounting for his sins, accounting for them in a faulty way, will in turn become an error that must be added on to the original list. Each failure induces and requires more accounting. Everything is immediately divided, subdivided, classified, numbered off, in annotations, meditations, exercises, and mysteries. This repetitious mental gymnastics causes fragmentation of the mind and the differs in the different of its parts with the emerge of a new self. By means of this most subtle form of hypnosis, the mind of the Jesuit is reoriented, reprogrammed, and altered. In this way, the men of the Society of Jesus, although scattered over distant nations, are said to have a similitude of manners and mental state. Jesuits in all Roman Catholic countries are also observed to have a character peculiar to themselves, great zeal and unquestioning obedience to the general. Wow. Let's see here. That ends that chapter, and I just want to see how long the next chapter is. It's not too long, so I think I'm going to just go ahead and read it. Chapter 12. <clears throat> Unhesitating Obedience, the General and the Holy Office. Opai, I can't say that word. They do just as they are ordered. I can assure you, gentlemen, that we have to deal not with emperors and cabinets only. We must take into consideration even secret societies who have agents everywhere, determined men encouraging assassinations and capable of bringing about a massacre at any moment. Benjamin Disraeli. The power of the general of the Jesuits is incredibly great, even greater than that of the Pope himself in holding the place of God. 
The Jesuit constitutions expressly enjoin every member of the order to see the general as vicarious Christi, representative of Christ, that is, to acknowledge Christ as if he were present in the person of their general. For this reason, the Jesuits referred to the general as the Black Pope or his great eminence. Thus also the Jesuit takes a vow of obedience to the visible Pope. It is to the general that every Jesuit owes his first and utmost allegiance, says Chol Cholatias, the French lawyer who read their constitutions. In not fewer than 500 places in the constitutions are expressions used similar to the following. We must always see Jesus Christ in the general, be obedient to him in all his behests, as if they came directly from God himself. A similar Latin title, Vicarius Fili D, representative of the Son of God, is also used to address the Pope. Interestingly, vicarious, from which we get vicar, is an adjective meaning that which supplies the place of, its Latin root being visus, which means alternative, or in the place of. Hence, when used as a noun, vicarious means substitute for. While in the Greek, vicarious is aimed as antichrist. I mean, anti, I'm sorry, I put antichrist, but it is. is translated as anti. Thus, the title vicarious Christi is used by the Jesuit general can be translated as antichrist or literally in the place of Christ. Likewise, the Pope's title vicarious fili translates as in the place of the Son of God. This is much too important to be brushed over, and so I have devoted an entire chapter to its analysis. But we have digressed somewhat. Turning to the plenary power of the Jesuit general, after Laloya's passing from the field of action, a certain Diego Lanez succeeded him as general. One of the very first acts of the new general was to assemble a congregation at which he caused it to be decreed solo apposicius generalis auditoritum abit regulus fundi. The general only had the right to make rules. That's what it means. Consequently, the whole order with all its authority is comprised in general. The general is so powerful that he may make and alter special constitutions for the society, abrogate them, and make new ones, even giving these documents any date he pleases. The constitutions further provide that all such new rules must be regarded as confirmed by the popes from the time they are dated, such as the power of black pope. Our father general said the, Jes the Spanish Jesuit F. Doza in 1667, as all know, governs Rome itself and the popedom too, we make war at our pleasure. This is proof, if any is needed, that the glorified figurehead Pope, like the faithful servant of Don Cossack's Rosinetti, never stir too far from his master's side. Indeed, the shrewd Roman Italian populace have long shown the recognition of this fact by styling these two great personages severely, the white Pope and the black Pope. Ab Abbott Fremont, Fremont also was of the view that the Jesuits in the person of their general dominant, the Vatican. Alexander Robertson puts it thus, The general of the Jesuits, the black pope, is the real and only pope. The one who bears the title is only a figurehead. I believe he's the image of the beast myself. That's just my opinion. It is the Jesuits' policy he pursues, the voice that speaks through him, the hand that guides him. When illustrating this fact to me, Count Campello was a great friend of the late Pope Pio Nono, and that's Pius the Ninth. Drew a circle and said, within that circle, he, the Pope, is free. If he crosses it, he is a dead man. And the respected Jesuit Jean-Pierre Curie, who was professor of moral theology in the College Romaine, the Jesuits in College Rome, Collegium Romanium, as in truth, the society, the Jesuits, has never from the very first obeyed the Pope, whenever its will and his happened to run counter to each other. And another author says the Pope must obey the Jesuit cardinals, who, though they kiss his foot, by his hands. The gratuitous weapon in the Pope's hand. Although highly educated and intelligent, nay, erudite, 
that the Jesuits must take an oath to have no mind of their own to call black, white, if the Pope, black Pope, general says so and if it be in the church's interest so to do each and every member of the order of the lawyer was to be in the hands of his superior as the axe is in the hands of the woodcutter and as a staff is in the hand of an old man which serves him whenever and in whatever thing he pleased to use it or as mccullough puts it a gratuitous weapon to be placed in the pope's hand the black pope that is Every Jesuit, <clears throat> every Jesuit wrote English poet Robert Southey is like a suit of clothes, an empty mantle with another man on the inside, the person, the will of the Jesuit. To quote Southey's elegant satire, a Jesuit may be shortly described as an empty suit of clothes or a mantle with another person living in them, who acts for himself, thinks for himself, decides for himself, whether he shall be a prince or a beggar, and moves him about wheresoever he pleases, who allows him to exhibit the internal aspects of a man, but leaves him none of the privilege, no liberty, no property, no affections, not even the power to refuse obedience in order to commit the most atrocious of crimes. For the more he outrages his own feelings, the greater his merits. Obedience to the superior is only idea of virtue, in all other respects, he is a mere image. The Jesuit must render absolute and unquestioning obedience to the general without reserve. If he says peace, the Jesuit must say peace. If he says war, the Jesuit must say war. Whatever the general says or commands, the Jesuit must say ditto. Rule one of the spiritual exercises of the lawyer states, with all judgment laid aside, we ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey our Holy Mother, church hierarchical and spiritual exercises rule 13 instructs the jesuit to agree as follows i will believe that the white what i see is black the hierarchical church so defines it so defines it further when a jesuit takes his fourth and peculiar vow he binds himself to go without question delay or repugnance to whatever region of the earth and on whatever errand the pope may be pleased to send him this he promises to the omnipotent God and to his general, holding for him the place of God. The wisdom, justice, and righteousness of the command he is not to question, he is not even to permit his mind to dwell upon it for a moment. It is the command of his general, and the command of the general is the precept of the Almighty. His superiors are over him in the place of the divine majesty. When the command of the superior goes forth and the person to whom it is directed is not to stay till he has finished a letter his pen is tracing, says the constitutions, he must give instant compliance so that holy obedience may be perfect in us in every point in execution, in will, in intellect. Indeed, obedience and Jesuitism is styled the tomb of the will or death of the will. It is said that this is a blessed blindness which causes the soul to see the road to salvation. Therefore, the members of the Society of Jesus are taught to immolate their will as a sheep is sacrificed. They are told that they are to be in the hands of their superior as the axe is in the hands of the woodcutter, or as a staff in the hands of an old man which serves him wherever and in whatever thing he pleases to it. On this point, James Wiley comments most eloquently, and all of mankind do not furnish another example of a despotism so finished. To put it more crisply, the constitutions enjoin that they who live under obedience shall permit themselves to be moved and directed under divine providence by their superiors, just as if they were a corpse, well disciplined like a corpse, says Laloya, which allows itself to be moved and handled in any way. In any way? Yes, in any way. This obligation to obey as if cadaver requires every Jesuit to be not just a corpse, but a puppet. They must do just as they are ordered. As in 1709, when they had almost the entire community of nuns at Port Royal excommunicated, some of the nuns were in prison while others were dispersed to different convents for refusing to submit to the bull, Vienem Domini Soba, so a boath. The convent was later leveled to the ground. 
will not dwell on the details, nor the violence perpetuated against these defenseless nuns. It is none to record here that an order and council at Rome was obtained for the removal of every sister from the convent, together with the destruction of Port Royal under the auspices of Pope Clement the Eleventh. On January twenty second, seventeen o nine, the Jesuits had the whole edifice demolished completely. Even that did not satisfy the revengeful Jesuits. In 1711, the bodies in the convent cemetery, the burial ground of the nuns for 500 years, were disinterred, dug up with the grossest circumstance and indecency. All the corpses, or what remained of them, were thrown into a single pit, dug for that very purpose in the cemetery of St. Lambert. But even more diabolical was the fact that the pit was then left open, allowing the bodies and bones to be eaten by dogs. What savagery, what rabidness, what evil venom of serpents. Surely we are justified in saying of these Jesuits, the very worst kind of monks. Jesuit monarchy today. The Jesuit monarchy covers the globe. And at its head is a sovereign general, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, so complicated and yet so harmoniously controlled by a single hand. Under the constitutions, one man, the general, is given power as an absolute monarch over the whole Society of Jesus, distributed throughout all regions of the world and over all the individual members of the same. The regular Jesuit sources, writes Manford Barthel, always blandly insists that the general concerned himself entirely with the spiritual and administrative manners. This, but this could not be further from the case. In Rome, where he resides, the general has a council of five assistants who hold office until the death of the general, one each for Italy, France, Spain, the countries of Spanish origin, one for Germany, Austria, Poland, Belgium, Hungary, Holland, and one for English-speaking countries, England, Ireland, United States, Canada, and British colonies, except India. Dollar writes, Jesuit monarchy covers the globe as its head, as we have said, is a sovereign who rules over all, but is himself ruled over by no one. First come six grand divisions termed assistants, satrapies, or princedoms. These comprehend the space stretching from the Indus to the Mediterranean, more particularly India, Spain, Portugal, Germany, France, Italy, Sicily, Poland, Lithuania. Lithuania, I'll see these areas, the Jesuits have established missions. The Assetines and provinces are headed by assistants and provincials. The Society of Jesus and the Holy Office. As we have read much earlier, the original bull of Pope Paul III constituting the Society of Jesus. What was that? Okay. Huh. <clears throat> As we have read earlier, much earlier, the original bull of Pope Paul III constituting the Society of Jesus gave to Ignatius de Loya and his companions the power to make constitutions and particular rules and also to alter them. This legislative power rests in the hands of the general and his office or perfect that is in a congregation representing them. This congregation was once called the Holy Office of the Inquisition, a.k.a. the Sacred Roman Congregation and Universal Inquisition. Today it is called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Office or department under which all modern members of the Society of Jesus continue to take their orders is the said revamped Sacred Roman Congregation and Universal Inquisition, a title that for centuries had provoked universal revulsion and disgust. It is important to remember that the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith was born in 1542 under the name Sacred Congregation of the Universal Inquisition and that this Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was, until 2005, directed by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger for 25 years before he assumed the title Pope Benedict XVI. Wow, really? No wonder he looks so full of wickedness and evil. His eyes frighten me. Wow, that's crazy. Let me do this again. It is important to remember that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was born in 1542 under the name 
the sacred congregation of the universal inquisition and that the same congregation for the doctrine of faith was until 2005 direct by cardinal joseph ratzinger for 25 years before he assumed the title pope benedict the 16th the history of the congregation is shortly as follows it was established on july 21st 1542 by pope paul the third under the constitution which also established a universal inquisition in 1908, the word Inquisition was dropped from the title and it took the name the Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office, a.k.a. the Holy Office. Realizing the need to distance itself from its past atrocities, it underwent another facelift in 1965 during the papacy of Pope Paul VI. Hitherto, it was known not as the Holy Office, but under the new title of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. For over two decades, until 2005, that congregation was headed by the Bavarian-born Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. It may surprise you, dear reader, but the present Pope was once called the Great Inquisitor and the Pit Bull of the Inquisition by the Jesuits. Mr. Datsoski, I am sure, will agree. In fact, Ratzinger is a Jesuit picked cardinal from Bavaria, Germany. We present proof of this assertion below. So here we go again. Now, Francis was not the first Jesuit pope. Was not. Wasn't. Here we go. Prior to becoming pope, Ratzinger was appointed professor of the highly prestigious theological department at the University of Tübingen in Germany on the strong recommendation of the Jesuit Hans Kung, who at the time was dean of the department. Interestingly, as we shall see later, Bavaria was home to the Jesuit founder of the revolutionary order called the Illuminati, and it is therefore not surprising that Bavaria would later become the beating heart of Hitler's Nazi revolution. Pope Benedict XVI is intensively Bavarian and was educated at colleges in Bavaria, most of which were founded and controlled by the Jesuits. In 1252, the then Pope made a decree stipulating the exact details of how the prisoners of the Inquisition were to be tortured, including children from the age of 12 and upward. More than 50 million members of the human family is estimated to have been slaughtered under the sanction of the Catholic Church. Don Dowling, History of Rome, Book 8. For nearly six centuries, writes Peter D. Rosa in The Dark Side of the Papacy. Not one of the 80 popes from the 13th century to the 19th century said a word against the diabolical machinery of the Inquisition. Rather, they each added their own cruel touch to the awful machinery of death. If the objection be raised that Catholics too have been killed by Rome, then we say sure, for Rome will wade through the blood of Roman Catholics to get to the heretics. Never forget that. Dr. Paul Collins, a Catholic priest and Harvard graduate, makes the following comment about this Jesuit monstrosity called the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. The Holy Office, oh, hold on one minute, this video is done. I'm going to exit out before it starts talking. Okay, here we go. All right. Dr. Paul Collins, a Catholic priest and Harvard graduate, makes the following comment about this Jesuit monstrosity called the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. The Holy Office may have changed its name, but the ideology underpinning it has survived. It has certainly not changed its methods, and he adds, this body has no place in the contemporary church. It is irreformable and therefore should be abolished. And author Michael Bagent writes that for 25 years, Ratzinger was the power behind the congregation, where he served unwaveringly as enforcing of Catholic dogma and moral theology. Now he himself is exercising the papal power. According to Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, one is not free to choose truth unless the truth means acting in accordance with the church's teachings. To do otherwise, says Benedict, is to embrace error. Thus, we see that despite its, its reorganization and new name, the congregation still has the same role to protect and advocate Catholic teaching on matters of faith and morals and to search out and punish those whom it considers offenders. Article 48 of the Apostolic Constitution on the Roman Cura, Pastor Bonus, promulgated by Pope John Paul II, 
on June 28, 1988, states, Duty proper to the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith is to promote and safeguard the doctrine on the faith and morals throughout the Catholic world. For this reason, everything which in any way touches such matter falls within its competence. The Jesuit Mission Despite the apparent rigidity implied in the Jesuit hierarchical structure, the order has always been characterized by its great flexibility and capacity for adaptation to suit whatever distant lands, changes in the times, or adverse situations in which they were to operate. To better equip them in their tasks, the following secret instruction is given to all ranks of their order. Should any one ask on what errand the good fathers have come, they are to make answer that their soul object is the salvation of souls. They are to be careful to maintain a humble and submissive deportment. They are to pay frequent visits to the hospitals, the secret chamber, and the prisons. They are to make great show of charity. These good deeds will not lose their reward. Men will begin to speak of them and say what a humble, pious, charitable order of men these fathers of the Society of Je Jesus are. Thus the newcomers receive the respect and reverence of the best and most eminent in the neighborhood. They are further told to say their, that their vow is one of poverty, that they have nothing to do with politics or wealth, their sole object being to put down heretics. But Russell, William Russell reminds us that the Jesuits are in fact chosen soldiers under the command of a general, and they are required to attend to the transactions of the great men of the world, to study the dispositions of persons in power, and to cultivate their friendship. Ignatius, who formed the Jesuits, called his order the Militia of Christ, but in fact they are the Pope's Militia. A famous Jesuit general, Michael Angelo Tamburini, once boasted in 1720 to the Duke of Brazac, See, my grace, from this room I govern not only Paris, but China, not only China, the whole world, without anyone knowing how it is managed. Speaking of his immense power, Jesuit general Muto Belshidi, Beto Chi, in 1640 vaunted, Members of the society are dispersed in every corner of the world and divided into as many nations and kingdoms as the earth has limits, visions, and amongst so many different geniuses, no controversy, no contention, nothing which gives you a hint to perceive that they have more than one. They have the same aim, same conduct, same vow, which, like a conjunctal knot, has tied them together. At the last sign, one man, the general, turns and returns the entire society and shapes the revolution of so large a body. Dr. Wiley gives us an insight into the breadth of this papal militia and the means by which the general governs all. Among the ranks of the Jesuits, one will find the day laborer, the tradesman, the abluent banker, the shoemaker, and the porter, the stoled cleric, dignitary and the learned professor, the cowled minidame, and all grades of literary men, from the philosopher, the mathematician, and the historian to the schoolmaster, the reporter on the provincial newspaper. All professions are enrolled in society. Marshaled and in continual attendance before their chief stand a host so large in number and so various in gifts that working together there is perhaps few cannot they cannot achieve at the word of the general they go and at his word they come speeding over seas and mountains across frozen steppes or burning plains on his errand pestilence or battle or death may lie on his path the jesuits obedience is not less prompt selecting one the general sends him to the royal cabinet making choice of another he opens to him the door of parliament a third he enrolls in a political club. A fourth he places in the pulpit of a church, whose creed he professes that he may betray it. A fifth he commands to mingle in the saloons of the literarity. A 
six, he sends to act his part in the evangelical conference. A seventh, he seeks besides the domestic hearth. And an eighth, he sends afar off to barbarous tribes who are speaking a strange tongue and wearing a rough garment. He executes amidst hardships and perils and will of his superior. Indeed, exclaimed one Jesuit general, we have men glancing over the long roll of philosophers, orators, statesmen, scholars, and lawyers, ready to serve him at a moment's notice in the state and in the church and in the camp or in the school, at home and abroad. We have men for martyrdom, if they be required. Therefore, warns Wiley, we cannot be too much on our guard for the whole society, Jesuitism, being founded on a law of unhaste unhesitating obedience can bring its force on any given moment with unerring and fatal accuracy. British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli appears to have been alert to this fact when on September 20th, 1873, he told an audience at Allysbury, I can assure you gentlemen that those who govern must count with new elements. We have to deal not with emperors and cabinets only we must take into consider, consideration secret societies. We have agents everywhere, determined men, encouraging assassinations, and capable of bringing about a massacre at any moment. The Jesuits, says Wiley, have a most solemn form of consecration when preparing to commit their regicides. Bathing the sword or weapon with which the deed is to be done with holy water, he put it into his hand and pronounced the following exorcism. Come, ye cherubims, ye seraphims, thrones and powers, come ye holy angels and fill up this blessed vessel with the immortal glory to kill the tyrant and the heretic, give his crown to a Catholic king, comfort part of him we have consecrated to this office, strengthen his arm, he may execute his enterprise. Now isn't that something? To quote St. Jerome, uh, non hoc liquid, quote St. Jerome, said Napoleon Bonaparte, the general of the Jesuits insists on being master sovereign over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work if committed for the interest of the Society of Jesus, or by the order of its general. Having been trained like Pavlo's dogs, the Jesuits are conditioned to wait eagerly on the word of the general, salivating at his every command. Prompt and blind obedience is expected of every Jesuit. Without excuses and murmurings, they should try to maintain the true abnegation their own wills and judgment. Constitutions, Part 5, Chapter 1. Danello Bertoli, a noted Jesuit historian and rector of the Jesuit College at Rome, writing in defense of Jesuitism, expresses his Jesuit vow thus, I should regard myself as a dead man, without will or intelligence, as a little crucifix which is turned about unhesitatingly at the will of him who holds it as a staff in the hands of an old man who uses it as he requires it, as it suits him best. Consider this statement from paragraph 273 of the French edition of the Jesuit Constitution, translated from the edition written by their first General Aloya. As far as possible, we should all think alike and speak alike, and differing doctrines ought not to be permitted, either orally or in books. All books published must be approved by the superior in regard to things which are to be done. Diversity should be avoided as far as possible. Thus the pious wretch, Laloya, in the words of Thomas Carlyle, has done more mischief in the earth than any man born since, who reduced millions of brothers to spiritual mummyhood of unhesitating obedience. I quote next from Regeli Societis Jesu. Jesu. Regulations of the Society of Jesus, Volume 2, 1827, Paragraph 204. Superiors must report to the provincial about persons and things, not only those inside the society, but also about all what is done by us with other, others, successes and failures, and the provincial must know everything as if he was there. 
Thus, we see that a Jesuit private vocation is to travel the world like a spy and report back to his superiors, while his official mission is to preach peace and the care of souls, but if required of him in the interest of his church or his order to instigate war. Indeed, the Jesuit is always speculating on the vocations for martyrdom, always prepared to play the part of even to die as a victorious martyr. Today, the Society of Jesus, the largest order in the Roman Catholic Church, operates in 112 nations on six continents, all of which operations are under the discreet eye of the general. And it is said of them, Copi, Basuant, Ad, Minus, Ek, Isu, I can't say all those words. That is to say, they do just as they are ordered. Not even the Pope can rein them in. For we must not forget what Count Sirio di Capello, Capello, a close friend of Pio Nono, Pope Pius IX, 1846 to 1878, said, There is a circle drawn by the Jesuits around the Pope, within which he, the Pope, is free to act, but if he crosses it, he is a dead man. Wow. We'll pick up next time in Chapter 13, Crack. Groups, the training of a Jesuit. Give me the child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. Wow. All right. Keep your eyes on Jesus, brothers and sisters. Your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And embed the word of God upon the tablets of your hearts, so you and I will not sin against God or be deceived.